My name is Lori Paris, and welcome to She Life. My mother, Catherine Smith Gatormson, whose mother is Catherine Victoria Smith, whose mother is Nancy Smith, whose mother is Marion McKenzie, named me Lori Jean. I knew only two of these four women, but I carry their blood in my veins and their memories in my bones. May I speak our collective truth in a way that makes good change in a world that needs great change. The time has come for you and I to take our rightful sacred place in a culture that denies it. This is my story and journey to uncover the truth that supports my right to do just that, no matter the cost. I hope you decide you deserve that sacred place too. Episode 2, Queen Maeve and Eccles Glen. Episode 2 is dedicated to the late Philip Edwards, an Indigenous scholar and researcher who brought to light the reality of missing and murdered Indigenous women in the city of Thunder Bay. May his soul rest in peace knowing that he, his story, and his important work have not been forgotten. On November 28, 2020, just four days before he passed away, he posted these words on his Facebook page. The nature of so-called Satanism I encountered is one I would characterize as one that derives its happiness and affluence from the labors and suffering of others. As such, it is a happy, positive Satanism, as long as it gets what it needs. Affluence, power, and earthly pleasure are achieved also through the suffering of others in warfare. Soldiers and civilians are the sacrifices. While not declared allegiance to Satan, it is in principle the spirit of the beast. While pledging equality and peace, the real objective is privation of the good. It is an exclusive cult of control. Enslavement has always been their objective. The decent enslaved people, of which there are many, should supply their pleasures, is what it is all about. Great-great-grandpa Smith ran fast. I mean really fast. Born in Stornoway of the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, John Smith was a blacksmith by trade and immigrated to York Factory, Canada on August 24, 1869. These crescent-shaped chain of islands are known for crofting, fishing, the Coolin Hills of Skye, Gaelic literature and music, and Harris Tweed. In the 19th century, Many Scots chose to leave these islands due to social unrest and moved to Australia and Canada. My great-great-grandfather was one of the Scots who headed to Canada. Upon arrival, he immediately found a guide, a man named John Fiddler, and they headed to Norway House, a settlement 30 kilometers north of Lake Winnipeg, where he would begin his employment at the Hudson's Bay Company. John Smith's job was to carry the mail along the rugged shores of Hudson's Bay between York Factory and Fort Severin, and he did so for about 20 years. In 1896, at the age of 47, Smith made this 500-mile trip in just 10 days, setting a record that family members say has not been broken to this day. I was able to get details of his life from an article written for a magazine honoring the 75th anniversary of the town of Selkirk, Manitoba. The article titled, The Smiths, A Rare Picture, shared that John Smith tried to return home to Scotland twice, but only succeeded in doing so once. It said, I quote, He made two trips to his native land, one in 1872, but the longing for the wide open spaces was too much for him, and he returned to Canada three years later, again disembarking at York Factory. For seven years, he worked at his trade at Fort Severin. The story goes on to say that in September 1883, found him en route home again in the ocean of, with Captain John Hawes as skipper. Storms at Nelson Shoals, 28 miles out of Fort Churchill, forced them to drop anchor. However, they could get no anchorage because of the wild northwest winds, and after being tossed about for days, they arrived back at Churchill. Before they could drop anchor, the tide rose, and they were heaved back into the bay again until two days later 
when the stormy weather settled. This was the last attempt he made to return to Scotland. Unquote. It is my understanding that Grandpa Smith could run, but he could not swim. I never heard this story about John Smith growing up and had no idea where my ability to run long distance came from when I tried out for the Chief Pegwish Junior High School cross-country team in Winnipeg in the early 1970s. I was able to run far and with a good steady pace and had placed sixth in the provincial championships on the rolling hills of Miami, Manitoba. I grew up in Winnipeg, a small city in the heart of Canada that in 1960 had a population of 500,000 and today has grown to 833,000 people. I was born unmoneyed, the term I use when relaying my story in life. I believe it sounds less intrusive, more idealistic in the cause of promoting dignity within that structure. I never know if it works or if people still believe poor is poor, poor is bad, that poor means something ugly. For several years after the bank had repossessed our home, our family lived in Jigaboo Town, now referred to as Jigtow, in the north end of this city. Dad preferred to drink than make the mortgage payments. Jigaboo Town was made of brick houses, brick pavement, and six-foot brick walls to keep the Jigaboos from view. It was a brand new development back then, substantially smaller than what it is today, and I would sometimes walk alone to church up Chudley Avenue from the corner of Gilbert Street, where this low rental housing community had been built. St. Peter's was a small Catholic parish located at 1493 Magnus Avenue, and it is an eight-minute walk according to Google Maps. St. Peter's Parish eventually became St. Peter's Catholic Church and is now located on Key Wayton Street. The old church has survived and is now called the Raymond Flett Memorial United Church. I remember a children's Christmas party organized by the parish before moving to Jigtown. I knew we needed the gifts under the Christmas tree that year and managed to get to the event, although my dad, a Canadian Pacific Railway dining car waiter, was on the road and my mom, a homemaker, was too tired to take me. After the party, I was given charge of the donated Christmas gifts and clung to them against my tiny body to transport them up the back lane from the church to our home. The snow slowed my progress, but not as much as the effort needed to drag the desired packages through the wind and bitter cold of a prairie winter. The weather had not cooperated with the party that day, and there was more snow on the ground than when I had left. I held the treasures tight knowing if I dropped them, I would not be able to pick them back up and carry on. Near tears, I found the strength to move ahead, a strength that stayed with me the rest of my life. You just couldn't afford to give up. If you did, it was game over. I knew that. John Smith knew that. And most of the women I have had the privilege of walking with know that. I did make it to the gate of our backyard fence, exhausted but very happy, when I saw my mother rushing from the side door to help carry me and the Christmas gifts into the house. In the early years of my recovery from alcoholism, I was able to purchase 51 acres of land off a side road in a small village that in 1904 was named Eccles Glen, after the ancient High King of Ireland, Eochaid Fidlech, whose daughter was the infamous Queen Maeve. The land held a log home with no running water that needed much repair. There was a tiny guest house, an old sauna and garage, the remains of a barn that had burnt in the past, the water in the well undrinkable. It was mine, and it was heaven. Here is where my new life began, from a life that was pulled off course by a bottle of magic fluid that helped at first, and then laid me flat on the ground in the end. I found a grant that bought a new roof, and built a sacred fire inside a large homemade teepee of tarps and canvas to begin to live by the traditional teachings of the indigenous people who had healed me. Queen Maeve's home was in Rathcrawhan, Ireland, home of the legendary Cave of the Cats, known as the Door to Hell by ancient Christian scribes. Perhaps whomever had originally named this village Eccles Glen had known about this Door to Hell 
and knew it existed in this village too. A door that I would discover and experience phenomena and entities not of this world. The trees were plenty, the land filled with bears, moose, deer, fox, wolves, and even lynx, but there were also predators in those woods, the kind that walked on two legs, not four, and as a young woman, the two-legged animals were the ones that I always had to be on guard for. Two years later, in 1906, the name of this village was changed to Nolaloo, an acronym for the Northern Lands and Lumber Company, a village once deemed deserving of a name honoring an Irish high king whose daughter was the infamous Queen Maeve, would find itself stripped of such a magical beginning and named after a lumber company that clear-cut the land of the trees. And five years later, in 1909, the community would build a depot and name it the Farmer's Mercantile Cooperative in the village proper. The Mercantile was a two-story hand-hewn log building sitting in between the Whitefish River and the Port Arthur Duluth Railway Line, and across the river was the main highway that could be reached by crossing a small steel Bailey Bridge. The Port Arthur Duluth Railway carried the farm produce to market after it was collected at the Mercantile, and with the funds from the sales, the villagers would purchase their needed farm and household supplies from the cooperative. I would continue my spiritual journey in the bush among the trees and wildlife of northwestern Ontario, in this village with its cooperative that is today referred to as the Farmer's Mercantile Building. I would eventually marry the man who owned this building and discover a portal in the second floor loft after a lucid dream. A portal that acted as a purgatory for the lost souls of this village and a portal that allowed me to see the spirit of a priest after I'd returned home from a trip to France. The same trip where I'd been threatened by the devil after seeing the woman crucified on the cross in a dream. The priest coming through the portal was hiding what he was carrying from wherever he had come from. I was frightened for my life because I believed if he got anywhere near me, he would kill me. Eventually, I deciphered what he was hiding. I learned he was hiding and carrying the secret of the mystery of Rennes-le-Château, the secret that made this priest, Francois Beranger Saunier, a wealthy man. The Cave of the Cats is one of the most important underworld portals in Irish mythology, and my unintentional discovery of the portal in the hundred-year-old loft of the farmer's mercantile came many years after I was introduced to this building and the man who owned it. One of the first invitations was from a tiny blonde girl named Miki, who I had agreed to watch one afternoon while her mother was in the city. Miki and her family lived across the highway in the old schoolhouse that now served as their home, where their family operated an antique store and pizza place. Miki and her siblings would visit the man who owned the mercantile, mainly because he had an old vintage 7-Up cooler full of cold pop that he shared with them. I accepted her invitation to head over to the old building, and we walked down her long grass and gravel driveway, crossed the highway, then the old Bailey Bridge that spanned the Whitefish River. Miki led me to the door that once faced the tracks of the Port Arthur Duluth Railway, where she knocked as loud as she could with her tiny hand. Les, the man who owned the farmer's mercantile, answered somewhat surprised to see me. I was the new single woman in town, he the recent widower. My being there was fodder for gossip, if we were seen together, but he invited me in anyway, recognizing the young girl's purpose for being there and my discomfort. Les headed to the cooler as we stood by the door, returning with the cold treat for her, and then kindly offered the same to me. Miki needed nothing more from Les, and darted back outside to find her older siblings, her blonde hair flying as she sped out the door. I was now alone with the man who had just lost his wife, a man with a reputation of the village of not talking. I could talk, sometimes too much in my younger years, and thanked him for the beverage. Then, to my surprise, he spoke and asked if I would like to see the building. 
Beginning the tour, he led me away from the main floor that was open and dirty with a wood stove made from an old oil drum that sat in the middle of the large room. The original tin ceilings were peeling and sooty, the hardwood floors marked with the burning embers that had carelessly fallen from the homemade stove. Some of the hand-hewn log walls painted CPR red, a paint used by one of the Canadian rail lines that sometimes found its way into employees' homes. We then climbed to a landing up a set of crooked stairs without the aid of a handrail as such amenities had either gone missing or were never there in the first place. The landing led to the loft if you made a sharp left turn and walked up four more steps. I was impressed with the huge timbers that I used to guide myself up the stairs. They were smoother than I had imagined, their natural beauty visible as thankfully the painter's brush had not made it past the first floor. Moving up the stairs and along the wall for balance, the man who neighbor said never spoke began to point out the names of villagers from the past that were etched with pencil into the logs underneath my hand. I read the names that included dates, admiring the clear and lovely handwriting of an older generation. Would you like to add your name? Les asked, reaching for a pencil that sat handily in the pocket of his work shirt. Surprised and a little hesitant to accept the offer, I pondered for a moment and then accepted his invitation by taking the pencil from his hand and wrote my name and date as he watched. I couldn't help but wonder what this all meant. I knew by signing the log wall that I would be attaching myself in some small way to the history of the building, but I was unaware that day that I'd found true love with the quiet man who gave village children cold pop on hot summer days, and that if I took four more steps to my left, I would enter a haunted loft with a portal where I would one day see massive lightning bolts and hear thunder roar within that loft and see the spirit of a priest long dead but still carrying his treasure. And so in Eccles Glen, I built the lodges I'd been taught to build and sang the songs I was taught to sing and built sacred fires that would allow me to learn to hear the voice of the forest and spirits. I sat by the fire for many years, drank the medicines from the leaves, berries, and grasses of this forest, and tried to sever myself from the indoctrination of the Roman Catholic Church. I was living in fear that in changing those beliefs instilled in me by the men and women in black robes, that I would burn in hell, and that I would lose my relationship with Jesus in some way. And just as the priests and nuns had promised, the devil came calling. As relayed previously, I have been approached by the devil several times in my dreams. The first time I was approached with a message from him was in this glen that was now called Nolaloo. The fear that ran through my body left my bed soaked with perspiration, my clothes wet and warm and stuck to my skin. His face was close to mine. He had no qualms of speaking to me directly and had posed as a handsome man, a replica of the type I had been attracted to in my younger years. He had shoulder-length dark hair and a goatee, and when he knew I was looking at him, he bowed. And without hesitation, I bowed back. I could not move after that or speak. And when he knew he had my attention, he spoke. Welcome to my world. Get as close as you want. That was it. Ten words that sat me straight up in bed and had me worried for my soul. I had wondered how the devil was able to get so close to me. I later rationalized that I had given permission in some way when he tricked me into believing he was just a handsome man. Perhaps in that instant, I had shown no fear, and that was enough permission for the universe to grant access. Once there, he wasted no time in offering me his invitation. I was an outsider, and I was now welcome in his world. When I shared this dream with an Indigenous friend, the same friend this podcast is dedicated to, he said he only had one question for me. What color was he? I said, white. He replied, I knew it. We both laughed. I was nervous when telling Christian friends that I had bowed to the devil, knowing they would think I was somehow in collusion. I was not, and would offer the explanation that there was no way that the courtesy of his bow 
would go unacknowledged. They would have done the same, in my opinion, and bow as I did to the Cathars, king of the world, and the spirit known to the Buddhists as Mara. I shared the dream with the Buddhist monk who lived at the monastery on Devon Road, a short drive from my house. He seemed unconcerned and said I should be flattered that Mara was even paying attention to me. It just meant that I was on the right path. I didn't know about that, but I did know I was scared to close my eyes and sleep, and so I decided I would try to decipher the message when awake, since not to do so seemed reckless. The Indigenous teachings I had been honored to learn from traditional elders and knowledge keepers kept me focused with the natural world around me, and this Theravadan Buddhist monk over in the next township helped me to understand how to begin to be more fearless and believe that Jesus and the Buddha would not abandon me. Only I could abandon them. I would start the long and arduous journey to find my purpose for being on this planet and the reason that this powerful entity wanted to communicate with me. I would also stop running from the things I feared, but only after I got out of that house. I never thought the devil was only referring to Nalalu when he welcomed me to his world, the village where I had this dream, the village where I met my husband, and where I would organize and implement nine gatherings over nine consecutive years on the weekend of my sobriety date. I built the lodges on this acreage and held the gatherings free of charge for anyone of any denomination, of any race, of any gender, as long as they came in the spirit of peace. During these 36 days, over nine years, a Buddhist monk from Germany made the decision to disrobe, having longed for the touch of humans. I was gifted a beautiful hand drum from a group of Americans called the Children of the Four Winds that I still carry today. The youth that came every year, mainly friends of my daughters, camped with permission of their parents in the field outside the arbor, sweat lodge, and sacred fires that burned for the full four days and nights. We would dedicate every Saturday to them, driving them to the nearby lake to enjoy the afternoon, while a few of us stayed behind to prepare a feast of their favorite foods. On one of these Saturdays, a miracle occurred. The land and people who had stayed behind to prepare the lodges and feast for the youth were showered with the blessing of the Buddha when one of his relics from the ashes of his funeral pyre, burst. This relic had been secretly placed at the sacred altar erected to the south of the central arbor. The brilliant light that manifested and covered the land embraced anyone who saw it with love from a world unknown. A door had opened to see the light of a realm that most say doesn't exist. We saw with our own eyes in real time that it did exist, and for me, I knew I had seen and experienced the love that was needed to manifest on earth if it was to survive. Love that manifested peace, not war, that helped, not hindered, that honored the sacred role of women. At the ninth and final gathering, I would receive the answer to the question I had asked of the ancestors after many years of fasting and praying. My question was this, when would the plight of women end on this planet? The answer was not what I expected, but I am forever grateful for the two women that sat with me for the four days at the last gathering to keep the fires and hold the ceremonies. The only two women that had returned to this field that had seen the light of the Buddha descend upon it. The answer to my query was three simple words, stop getting married. In 1909, the year the Farmers Mercantile Cooperative was built in the village proper, Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, left the hospital he had worked at for nine years and started a private practice in his home. Jung was known for many things, his study of the collective unconscious, his influence in the creation of Alcoholics Anonymous, his interest in the Taos Pueblo Indigenous, his relationship with Sigmund Freud, and his Red Book. 
The Red Book was an exploration of Jung's dreams and daydream fantasies that he chose to write about, but not publish in his lifetime. A book with an epilogue that reads, To the superficial observer, it will appear like madness. An article written by Sarah Corbett for the New York Times Magazine, published in 2009, titled The Holy Grail of the Unconscious, tells the story of the publishing of Jung's Red Book some 48 years after his death, after being hidden in a drawer in his home in Switzerland and then stored in a Swiss bank vault, his family choosing to keep his work hidden, possibly concerned it could ruin Jung's solid reputation within his field of study and work. Jung was a scholar, a family man, a guru to many, and Jung was a dreamer. In the Red Book, he writes, I must learn that the dregs of my thought, my dreams, are the speech of my soul. I must carry them in my heart and go back and forth over them in my mind, like the words of the person dearest to me. Dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Why should I henceforth not love my dreams and not make the riddling images into objects of my daily consideration? Young also believed that dreams were the psyche's way of conveying important messages and put great value on them. Also in 1909, Young would make his first trip to the United States with Sigmund Freud to participate in a conference at Clark University in Massachusetts. Freud would never return to the U.S., but Young would return in 1925 and travel to New Mexico, being given an opportunity to meet and participate in ceremony with the Taos Pueblo Indigenous. The Pueblos have been given heritage status from UNESCO and is considered one of the oldest continuous communities within the United States. It is estimated that this Taos Pueblo community was built somewhere between 1,000 to 1450 AD, practicing their spiritual way of life without confrontation until 1620 when Spanish Jesuits tried to build the first Roman Catholic Church and forced the religion on them. History says the Spanish were ruthless in their methods to remove native culture from this community and replace it with Roman Catholicism. In his memoir titled Memories, Dreams, Reflections, Jung spoke about his meeting with the indigenous of New Mexico and said it had a profound effect on him because he became aware that he was imprisoned, quote, in the cultural consciousness of the white man, unquote. Jung was introduced to indigenous knowledge keeper Antonio Mirabel, also known as Mountain Lake, by a man named Jamie D'Angulo, who was working on a thesis he wanted to share with Jung, hoping Jung would use his influence towards starting, in D'Angulo's words, a steady campaign to integrate his thesis into the world. He wrote this hope in a letter to a friend, Mabel Dodge Luhan, a wealthy patroness of Irish descent, whose husband was Taos Indigenous, after meeting with Young in 1925. He also wrote Mabel that it was the dream of his life. Jamie D'Angulo was no ordinary man. He was a respected writer, poet, anthropologist, ethnologist, linguist, a medical doctor, and a psychologist. He was born in France to Spanish parents, was Catholic, and educated by Jesuits. My favorite description of D'Angulo came from the introduction in his book, The Lariat, written by David Miller. He, D'Angulo, crosses boundaries. He deals in alternatives. He is both a skeptical, scientific European and an enthusiastic, engaged witness to American Indian storytelling and spirituality. I think the most simple and profound statement made by D'Angulo was this. I want to know about Indian American lore because I believe that whites have lost their soul and they must find it again. Some of the things the whites have lost, the Indians have kept. He goes on. In America, the soil is teeming with the ghosts of Indians. Americans will never find spiritual stability until they recognize the Indians as their spiritual ancestors.
D'Angulo's thesis argued that the white American must preserve the Indian, not as a matter of justice or even of brotherly charity, but in order to save his own neck. The European can always tie back to his own mother's soil and find therein the spiritual pablum necessary to life. But the American, overburdened with material culture, is threatened with self-destruction unless he can find some way to tie himself to his own mother soil. The Indian holds the key. Perhaps if Young had kept his promise to D'Angulo to share his thesis 100 years ago, the path forward to reconciliation between our two nations would be less obstructed, more open to understanding that perhaps we should be assimilated into indigenous teachings and spirituality, not the other way around. This podcast is dedicated to my courageous friend, Philip Edwards, an Anishinaabe from White Sands First Nation near Armstrong, Ontario, a friend that was called a troublemaker for speaking out about the violence and unsolved murders of Indigenous women in Thunder Bay, a troublemaker that could speak four languages before he died, invented a phonetic language system to help Koreans learn English when he taught in that country for 10 years. Philip was a writer, a researcher, a teacher in post-secondary schools, and he was on the Thunder Bay Police Service Board when deaths of Indigenous women were occurring and knew he had a duty to bring his complaints forward. He was also an avid photographer, his apartment scattered with half-filled boxes of developed photos. Philip attended my daughter's grade 8 graduation with our family and captured a moment of joy that can never be forgotten now. I found the photo one afternoon as I rummaged through the boxes, waiting for Philip to finish what he'd been working on. The stunning photo was just there, waiting patiently for me, taken by a patient man who waited 22 years to hear that his complaint to start an inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women was going to happen in Canada. The last time I saw Philip, We sat at my sacred fire in Nolalu, where I first saw the devil. He had stayed for the day to have a day off from writing the complaint that would see him shackled to invisibility for nearly a quarter of a century. The day of fire and medicine was uneventful until he left to go back to the city. A knock on the door within an hour of his departure introduced me to the people who were watching him. They said they were salesmen, but their body language said otherwise. They were selling kitchenware on an obscure side road off a secondary highway in the Canadian backwoods, exactly the place to sell pots, pans, and cutlery. It was clear the message being sold that day was we know he was here, we know who you are, we are watching. I never saw Philip again after that day. Philip left Thunder Bay abruptly, One day, he just wasn't in that basement apartment. The same basement apartment with small windows that had been tapped on many times in the middle of the night, always followed by a voice telling him to get out of town. The group of activists who had helped Philip gather research to bring the complaint to authorities about missing and murdered Indigenous women in Thunder Bay could only hope and pray he would be safe and make contact at some point. I did not hear his voice again until December 2015 when he was interviewed by Carol Off on a popular CBC radio program called As It Happens. Philip was now living outside of Canada, contemplating a return home, encouraged by the announcement by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that an inquiry would occur. I thank Philip for the gift of friendship and the photo. I cherish both to this day and promise him I will not give up on the quest to end violence against women that he so courageously brought to light. I come from a colonist family. There's no denying that, but I have gratitude and I know whose land I live on and where I would be if his people had not saved me. I'm sure the creator has mended your broken heart, Philip, that stopped beating as you lay asleep in your bed on Manitoulin Island. You showed more courage 
than anyone I have ever met. And I think of you and that courage when mine is fading. May your soul rest in peace until we meet again. Ha <laughs> ha